the Shift Gold Friday Gold Wrap, your overview of this week's Precious Metals News. It's Friday, September 30th. I'm your host, Mike Meharry. Thanks for tuning in. Here I am, rock me like a hurricane. Yeah, that's my current situation uh, as I am here in Central Florida dealing with good old Hurricane Ian. So this episode of the Friday Gold Wrap is going to be a lot different than normal because I'm actually recording this on Tuesday. And obviously it's hard for me to do a wrap of what happens during the week when I'm recording it on Tuesday because we really haven't had much of the week. But given the fact that Ian is uh, on its way, and I think I'm pretty likely to lose power in the next few days, and I have no idea if I'm going to have power on Friday or not. Uh, I wanted to go ahead and just go ahead, get an episode recorded, get everything uploaded so that I can just make it live on Friday. That way you guys will have at least a show to listen to, and uh, I won't have to stress for the rest of the week about whether or not I'm going to be able to get this done and you know, just worrying about this show. Um, Honestly, for us, where I am, I'm in the Tampa Bay area, uh, things have improved greatly in terms of the forecast over the last 12, 24 hours. Uh, the storm has pushed significantly south, at least the anticipated track. And so, you know, we were thinking we might end up with catastrophic flooding here in the Tampa Bay area. I don't think that's a scenario. But again, uh, they're expecting a lot of wind, a lot of rain. There's going to be a lot of down trees. That means down power lines and Again, just don't want to have to deal with trying to do a show in the middle of all of that. So I'm going to go ahead and do this this way, uh, talk about a few things in terms of gold, and then we're going to talk a little bit about uh, the economics of hurricanes and natural disasters, which I think will be kind of fun and interesting, something different. Because, uh, you know, you hear me rant about the Fed every week, and who needs more of that, right? Anyway, um, so... Before we get into all that, let's talk a little bit about gold. Uh, obviously, we've had a huge sell-off since the last Fed meeting. Uh, when we talked on Friday, uh, you know, initially gold actually rallied a little bit after the Fed announced the 75 basis point con- uh, rate hike continued sounding very hawkish. But then on Friday, we started to see a sell-off, and that's just continued. In fact, I think we're probably going to test the 1600 level this week. On Tuesday, we were down in the 1620s. Um, Had a little bit of a a rally early in the morning, but that just didn't really hold. And uh, so, yeah, gold and silver both are just really struggling right now uh, in terms of price. And of course, really, when you boil it all down, it comes to dollar strength. And, you know, when you sit back and think about it, that's pretty nuts, right? We are in a period of historic inflation, but the dollar is at 20-year-plus highs. I mean, how does that even make sense? Doesn't inflation mean that the dollar is devaluing? Well, yes, yes, it does. But other fiat currencies are in even worse shape. They're devaluing even faster. So the yen, the euro, uh, the British sterling was hit hit record lows. Um, so they're dropping in value compared to the dollar even faster. So what, what we're dealing with here is basically the fact that the dollar is the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry. I mean, it's a mess, But it's not quite as big of a mess as the euro or the yen or some of these other fiat currencies. And then we have this whole, you you may have heard of the dollar milkshake theory, and um, not to get real in-depth into it, but basically the, the milkshake theory holds that the dollar is going to maintain strength as long as it's the reserve currency because there's always demand for dollars. And, And I think there's some truth to this. I think we're seeing that play out right now. Now, how long that will last, that's a whole different question. We've talked before about the fact that, you know, the dollar's position as the world reserve currency is on pretty shaky ground, and I think getting shakier. But as it stands now, people still want dollars, especially compared to some of these other um fiat currencies. So again, the cleanest dirty shirt in the laundry. Uh Mike Maloney, you may have heard of him. 
um, pretty well-known uh, economic an analyst. Uh, he put it this way, the U.S. dollar has strengthened so much and so quickly this year that it, it has become a juggernaut, trampling pretty much every other asset. And he's right. Think about it. Nothing else is going up, right? Stocks are crashing. Bonds are crashing. Crypto, crashing. Uh, commodities, maybe not crashing, but struggling. Uh, gold and silver, struggling. It's all about the dollar. And honestly, I don't see this changing until people come to grips with the underlying economic realities that we're dealing with. And that's hard. Understanding the dynamics is hard. Markets operate kind of on this 24-hour cycle, day-to-day, -day, what's in the news. A lot of these folks are not looking at the big economic picture. Um, and, and particularly people are trading, you know, the, to make a buck today. They're not looking at five years down the road or even even a year down the road. So it's a, it just, it's a different kind of dynamic. Now, I've talked about this economic reality over and over again because I think when it comes to gold and silver, when it comes to precious metals, that is really the key. I'm not all that interested in how it's trading day to day or week to week. I'm interested in the long term trends because I think that's where gold and silver really shine. When this economic house of cards finally collapses, that's the game changer. When we have the next financial crisis, when all of these bubbles really start to pop when something important breaks and starts that chain reaction that we saw in 2008. Uh, I, I, I think that's on the horizon. And, and really, I think that's it. As somebody who's interested in precious metals, uh, that that's what I'm looking at. Because to me, you know, my, my background is more in politics and political philosophy, um, and, and macroeconomics. I'm not really trained as a financial investor. I mean, I have an accounting degree. I've taken finance. I understand the concepts, but that's not really what I'm looking at. I'm looking at long-term. What is the government doing to us, doing to our money over the long-term, and how can I best protect my wealth from that? That's really what I'm looking at. So, Anyway, we've talked about this over and over again uh, on the show, so I'm not going to rehash you know, all of the, the dynamics with the Fed and the bubbles and stuff, but I do want to call your attention to an article that our technical analyst, Tony, wrote, and it's headlined, Calling the Fed's Bluff, They Are Holding a Losing Hand. And Tony argues that the Fed is basically bluffing when it comes to following all the way through with this inflation fight, something that I've been saying for a long time. Peter's been saying it, Peter Schiff, um, and he pretty much proves it. And he's looking at it in terms of the national debt, the, the debt load that the government is carrying. And he actually runs the numbers to see when the Fed will be forced to show their cards. And he's basically looking at when will these rising interest rates make the federal government's debt untenable. And read the article because it ain't long. Um, I'll link to it in the show notes page. And, and while you're on, we're on the subject, you might also want to check out Peter's podcast uh, where he broke down the last Fed meeting. I'll link to that as well. He kind of comes at it from a different angle than Tony, but he reaches the same conclusion. The Fed cannot win this inflation fight. It's what I've been saying over and over again. It's going to crash the economy in the process of trying to fight inflation, and it's not going to even beat inflation. So, there is going to come a point when the markets figure all of this out. I say this all the time. Economics always wins in the long run. But I think we're going to see this downward pressure on gold and silver for a while longer. I think we're going to have to wait and see how it plays out. Um, again, I mentioned last week I've got a friend that's in the finance world that's convinced that something big is going to break in the next couple of months, and that's really what's going to force the Fed's hand. We'll see how it plays out. You know, It's kind of like sitting here waiting for a hurricane. You don't really know what's going to happen. You kind of have a sense that there's storms on the horizon, uh, and yeah, you know, whew. This hurricane thing hasn't been fun, in case you were wondering. But, um, you know, here's the good news for people like me who are looking to accumulate gold and silver right now. 
I like $1,600 gold. I ain't going to lie. Um, I like silver below $20 an ounce. And eventually the bears are going to run out of gas. And uh, in the meantime, I'm getting a sale price on gold and silver. And of course, again, as I said, if something breaks in the economy sooner rather than later, things could reverse very, very quickly. We're at a precarious tipping point where things could implode and change very fast. Speaking of the Fed, I saw one bit of central banker absurdity today that I wanted to share with you guys. You know how these people are always blaming everything for inflation, but the real culprit, which is, of course, themselves? Uh, you know, they're blaming greedy corporations and Putin and coronavirus and, uh, you know, and on and on it goes. Well, I've got a new one for you. Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia President Patrick Harker. We don't hear a lot about him. He's not a voting member on the FOMC, but he is the head of the Philadelphia branch of the Fed. He says that all of this inflation is because we haven't built enough houses. I'm not kidding you. He said, since the Great Recession, the United States has not built enough housing to keep price growth relatively modest. Uh, this was in an essay that he published on the bank's website. He said, the shortage of homes, quote, is a major driver of the far too high inflation plaguing our country. Now, obviously, this far too high inflation has nothing to do with you people at the Fed printing $8 trillion since the Great Recession. No, it's the home builders' fault. They haven't built enough houses. You know, Honestly, sometimes I think we ought to go back to tar and feathers because these sociopaths are awful. All right, so enough of that. Let's talk a little hurricane economics because this is top of mind here at my house. And, uh, you know, with Ian approaching Florida, I've already heard the talk of the price gouging. And, you know, people have this visceral, emotional reaction to people raising prices during a disaster. And I get it. But it really is nothing but feels. In fact, price gouging, and I'm using air quotes around it because it's not even really a thing. You know, how, what price is too high? What, at what point does it become gouging? I, I don't know. They, they create these arbitrary numbers. They'll say, well, if it's 20% above the price that it was three weeks ago, then that's gouging. Okay, whatever. Rising prices serve an important economic function. Always remember that prices are signals. They're like street signs. They tell markets things. They signal things, and they help move and allocate resources. When you start messing with the price signals, you're going to create problems. Not allowing prices to rise actually causes more harm than whatever awfulness you might think price gouging entails. But of course, trying to explain this is like spitting into the wind. Hurricane pun kind of intended. In fact, I bet there are some people listening now that, oh, these price gougers are just awful human beings, you know. Maybe. But you know, at the first hint of the storm, uh, Governor DeSantis ish DeSantis? No. Governor DeSantis issued a state of emergency. And of course, that activates the price gouging statutes. And again, most people are going to cheer these statues. After all, they're going after greedy people who are taking advantage of other people who are in a difficult situation. And you know what? Price gougers might be greedy. They might just be nasty people. They might be morally abhorrent. And of course, we don't like greedy people. But that doesn't mean prices shouldn't go up in an emergency. In fact, there are sound economic reasons that so-called price gouging really isn't such a bad thing. It is a natural function of supply and demand. Prices rise as demand goes up and supplies tighten. What happens in a natural disaster? Demand goes up, supplies tighten. I went to Publix, uh, supermarket down here, you know, a couple days before the storm, no bottled water on the shelves. That's because there was a higher demand and not enough supply. So in a normal economic environment, prices would rise. This is economics 101, right? So let me give you an example and, and to kind of illustrate why price gouging, maybe not such a bad thing. Let's pretend like you know it's going to rain for a month straight. You get 30 straight days of pouring rain. Now, you'd probably 
want to buy an umbrella, right? A lot of people would want to buy an umbrella. And that means the price of an umbrella would probably go up because you have this huge demand all of a sudden for umbrellas. Now, let's say umbrella prices stayed really low because eh, some knucklehead politician passes a law that says you can't raise the price of an umbrella when the weatherman is predicting rain. Now, you might just buy one umbrella for every member of your family, right? Umbrellas are relatively cheap. We're going to buy a bunch of umbrellas. Of course, you'd run out of umbrellas, but you know that's your thinking. But if prices spiked in response to demand, prices go way up, you know, say they double or triple, you might rethink that. You might make do with just one or two umbrellas. And you know what that does? It leaves one or two umbrellas for somebody else. That's nice, right? The rising price would also help boost supply. If umbrellas get expensive enough, some guy in a less rainy locale, let's say Arizona, where there's much less umbrella demand, might be willing to bring a shipment of bumper shoots to your locality. It would be worth his while to pay higher transportation costs or manufacturing costs or whatever it is to take advantage of the higher price. He can make money. But if the knucklehead politician has his way, the price can't rise because he won't let it. And our budding umbrella entrepreneur, he's just going to stay home and sell sunglasses because there's no incentive, there's no profit for him in going off to sell umbrellas. All of this makes perfect sense, right? Doesn't matter. No matter how much sense it makes or how well I can explain it, people will always get angry about price gouging. I cannot win this argument. I recognize that. I make it anyway because I'm stubborn, but I'm not going to win it. People just react negatively to rising prices during a crisis. My feels trumps my logic every single time. Now, of course, the people that are complaining about price gouging, they'll go pay 12 bucks for a beer at a baseball game. But when you ask them to pay $3 for a bottle of water before a storm, you know, all of a sudden this is like some kind of crime of epic, epic proportions. Never mind that while people are yelling and screaming about price gouging, there's nothing left on the shelf to buy, right? I go to Publix, there's no water. Too bad there were no price signals to direct supply and demand. So here's an important thing to remember. Economic reality doesn't care about your feelings. Remember, remember what I said earlier, economics always wins. The problem here is that you see the results of price gouging, right? You feel the pain of higher prices, and it's easy to finger point at the greedy guy. And you may also feel the pain of shortages, but almost nobody understands that the anti-price gouging policy is what is causing the shortages. There's no obvious cause and effect there, so people just don't get it. It's a classic example of economist Frederick Bastiat's seen and unseen. Good economists consider both the obvious seen effects of a policy as well as the less obvious unseen effects. Unfortunately, most people are not good economists. But, you know, I got some good news for you. This hurricane is going to cause a lot of damage. And according to the Keynesians, this is great because rebuilding will stimulate the economy. Of course, this is even dumber than the price gouging business. You remember when Paul Krugman suggested that a fake alien invasion would be good for the economy because it would boost government spending? Remember that? I'm not making this up. Krugman actually made this argument. He said, if you discovered, you know, space aliens were planning to attack and we needed a massive buildup to counter the space alien threat and really inflation and budget deficits took secondary place to that, this slump would be over in 18 months. This was during uh, the economic downturn after the Great Recession. So we're going to fix the slump with a fake alien invasion. And he said, you know, it doesn't matter that we didn't need all of this alien invasion stopping stuff. It was still good that we made it because it stimulated the economy. So hell, if a, if a fake alien invasion is good, I think a legit hurricane has to be even better, right? Of course, this is the classic broken window fallacy, which again, uh, Frederick Bastiat wrote about. And the idea is if you break a window in a shop, 
That's good for the economy because the shop owner will have to pay the window fixer to repair the window. Then the window fixer can go buy new shoes, and the shoe seller will not have money to go to a ball game. And on and on it goes. So the argument is there's this, this long train of good results that come from this broken window being fixed. And those things do indeed happen. But as Bastiat pointed out, this ignores the unseen. The shop owner, he was going to buy a new suit. Now he can't because he has to pay the window fixer to fix the window. So the guy that sells the suits, he's not going to get that money that he would have otherwise got. That means he's not going to be able to maybe send his kid to college. I don't know. He won't have money that he otherwise otherwise would have had. So the bottom line is that there's this whole train of unseen effects, too, that nobody considers because you can't see them. And the bottom line is the shop owner is worse off, right? That's He is going to be worse off. He is having to replace a window that he didn't want to replace. That is going to keep him from doing things economically that he would have rather have done. Here's another truth for you. You don't get prosperity by destroying stuff. I mean... That should be self-evident, right? But, you know, when PhD economists get a hold of something, self-evident kind of goes out the broken window. So with that, I think we're going to wrap this up. It's late. I've spent all day doing storm prep. And we'll see what the next couple of days bring. But the good news is I have a podcast in the can for Friday for you guys to listen to. Before I go, as always, I want to remind you that this is a great time to talk to a shift gold precious metals specialist. We have gold prices that are low, silver prices that are low. It's basically silver and gold on sale. It's a great time to take advantage of these prices if you are interested in adding precious metals to your portfolio. And really, everybody should have some precious metals in their portfolio. I'm not one of these guys that say, you know, sell everything and buy all gold and silver. Uh, But I think it's an important part of a balanced portfolio. And a lot of people don't have precious metals in their portfolio at all. So if you want to learn more about how precious metals can help you in the current economic climate, looking ahead of what could be coming down the pike, um, Talk to one of these folks today. You can call 1-888-GOLD-160. You can email info at shiftgold.com. You can go to shiftgold.com, click on the Getting Started tab, and talk to a precious metal specialist right online. So do it today. As the saying goes, there's no time like the present. And with that, that is a gold wrap for this week. You can get more details on all of these stories and more, and of course, keep up with the latest precious metals news and analysis throughout the week over at shiftgold.com slash news. If you haven't done it already, you can subscribe to the Friday Gold Wrap over on your favorite podcasting platforms. Links to all of those are on the show notes page at shiftgold.com slash news. Uh, you can email me, M Mahari, M-M-A-H-A-R-R-E-Y at shiftgold.com. And I think that's it. So you guys have a fantastic weekend, and I will hopefully talk to you next time.